1941, railroad engineers warned that building a locomotive heavier than one million pounds would tear up the tracks and derail on tight mountain curves. Union Pacific faced a wartime gridlock. Trains stalled at the Wasatch Range, supply lines choked, and disaster loomed. Yet something unprecedented was about to challenge every expert prediction. How do you solve a crisis by risking the impossible? The answer begins where skepticism almost stopped history in its tracks. Freight trains lined up in the Wyoming night, headlights glowing in a queue that stretched for miles. Inside the Ogden dispatch office, the telegraph clattered with urgent messages. Another eastbound loaded with war supplies was stalled at the foot of the Wasatch Range, waiting for helper engines that were already hours behind. Every siding was packed. Yardmasters barked orders, trying to keep the endless stream of trains moving, but the mountains did not care about schedules. The 1.14% grade east of Ogden turned heavy trains into sitting ducks, engines straining and slipping, crews sweating as they waited for backup that never seemed to come. During World War II, Union Pacific's main line became a battlefield of logistics. The War Production Board demanded more coal, more tanks, more food, everything had to cross the Wasatch. In 1942 alone, freight traffic on the line doubled, surpassing 3 million tons. The existing challengers and mallets could only haul so much before stalling, so dispatchers stacked helpers at Echo and Evanston. But even with double headers and pushers, trains crawled over the summit at a crawl, and the backlog grew with every hour. The pressure on crews was relentless. Firemen shoveled coal by the ton, engineers watched boiler gauges edge into the red, and every delay meant another angry call from headquarters. Helper engines were supposed to be the answer, but they created their own traffic jams. Each time a helper was added or cut off at a siding, the main line jammed up behind them. Yardmasters at Ogden and Green River worked overtime, shuffling engines and crews in a desperate effort to keep the war effort rolling. Sometimes trains would sit for six, eight, even 12 hours just waiting for an available helper, while others limped over the summit at less than 10 miles per hour, eating up precious time and fuel. Logbooks from the era read like a litany of frustration. There was no margin for error. Every delay rippled across the continent, threatening to choke off supplies for the front lines. The Wasatch bottleneck was more than an inconvenience. It was a national emergency. The railroad's best minds knew something drastic had to change. The old solutions, more engines, more men, more hours, were not enough anymore. The only way out was to imagine a locomotive so powerful it could do alone what had always taken three or four. But building something that big on tracks never meant for such weight would take a leap far beyond what most thought possible. Engineers from across the railroad world lined up with warnings. The numbers alone seemed to defy logic. A single locomotive more than 1.2 million pounds, longer than a city block, meant to thunder over mountain grades built for smaller machines. Whispers turned to outcry. One phrase echoed in every meeting and every letter, it will tear up the tracks. The idea of such a giant rolling across rails, designed decades earlier, set off a wave of technical objections. Skeptics pointed to the weight, arguing that so much mass concentrated on a single machine would crush the rails sink the ties, and displace the stone ballast beneath. Trade journals filled with diagrams of failed giants, locomotives that twisted rails or split switches because their frames were too rigid or their weight too focused. Every railroad had a story, a heavy engine that left tracks warped in its wake, a sharp curve that buckled under the wrong load. The Wasatch Range with its 1.14% grade and tight turns, was no place for an experiment. Calculations passed hand to hand, each one predicting disaster. Some warned that the locomotive's driving wheels would hammer the rails until they cracked. Others feared the flanges, 
those steel lips that keep wheels on track, would grind so hard against the curves that rails would peel away from their fastenings. It would be a maintenance nightmare, the refrain went. Every mile would need rebuilding. The skepticism was not just about weight. The sheer length of the proposed locomotive raised alarms about how it would handle the bends carved into Wyoming's mountains. Put that much steel on a curve and you'll have your train in the ditch, one doubter insisted. A few pointed to the Challenger and Mallet engines, already the biggest in service, recalling how even those machines sometimes slipped or derailed when pushed too hard. If the helpers cannot do it safely, what makes you think a monster like this can? asked another. The warnings piled up. Letters arrived at Union Pacific headquarters, some unsigned, others from respected engineers, all repeating the same message. Too big, too heavy, it will destroy the track. For the men tasked with solving the Wasatch bottleneck, these voices could not be ignored. The challenge was not just to build something powerful, but to prove to the entire industry that bigger did not have to mean disaster. The burden of proof would rest on steel, steam, and the courage to bet everything against the odds. Otto Jabelmann sat at a long table, blueprints spread before him, pencil tapping against the edge as the debate circled around the room. The air at Union Pacific headquarters was thick with urgency. War traffic was overwhelming the line, and every solution so far had fallen short. Jabelman, Union Pacific's chief mechanical officer, listened as engineers from the American locomotive company, ALCO, weighed the risks. The numbers were daunting, but the need was greater. Jabelman did not flinch. He sketched out a vision for a locomotive unlike anything seen before, one that could do the work of three, haul the heaviest wartime trains over the Wasatch, and do it without wrecking the rails. The challenge was clear, but so was the opportunity. Alco's lead draftsmen gathered around the first design sketches, measuring lengths and weighing the impossible. At a time when most railroads hesitated to push beyond proven limits, this partnership dared to set the bar higher. Meetings ran late into the night, filled with arguments over wheelbase, axle loads, and whether any track could actually bear the weight. But the pressure from Union Pacific was relentless. Jabelman demanded a machine that could handle 3,600 tons up the mountain without a helper, and he refused to accept the word impossible. In the Alco shop, as the first full-scale drawings took shape, someone picked up a piece of chalk and wrote two words on the smoke box of the pilot engine, Big Boy. The name stuck instantly, bold, brash, a challenge to the doubters and a promise to the crews waiting on the other side of the mountains. That chalked nickname became the project's rallying cry, echoing through every design review and test run that followed. By the end of those tense weeks, the decision was made. Union Pacific and Alco would build the biggest steam locomotive the world had ever seen. There was no turning back. The railroad had committed itself to a radical idea that with the right engineering, even a million pound giant could run safely on rails built for another era. The skeptics would have their proof soon enough. Blueprints for the new locomotive stretched across the drafting tables at the American Locomotive Company, every line and number scrutinized by engineers who knew the stakes. The challenge was simple to state, but daunting to solve. It was to build a machine weighing over 1.2 million pounds that could move 3,600 tons of freight up a mountain without exceeding the limits of track or steel. Every calculation had to answer the same question. Could the rails bear the load? Or would they buckle under the strain? Otto Jabelman and his team started with the basics. They knew that sheer size alone would destroy any hope of success unless the weight could be spread out. The answer came in the form of the 4884 wheel arrangement. Four pilot wheels up front to guide the locomotive into curves. Two sets of eight massive driving wheels to carry the bulk of the weight and deliver power to the rails. And four trailing wheels to support the firebox at the rear. Sixteen drivers in total, each one helping to distribute the engine's mass across a greater length of track. The numbers told the story. 
with 762,000 pounds resting on the drivers. Each axle carried about 33,750 pounds, well within limits of 60,000 to 70,000 pounds set by Union Pacific's mainline standards in the 1940s. Even the heaviest sections of the locomotive, when broken down by axle, matched what the rails could handle. Articulation, splitting the engine into two pivoting frames, meant that the big boy could flex around curves, reducing the sideways forces that had doomed rigid giants in the past. On a three-degree curve, the equalized suspension and carefully engineered pivots kept flange forces low, preventing the wheels from grinding into the rails or pushing them out of alignment. Power was another part of the equation. Twin steam engines, one for each frame, produced 6,290 horsepower at the drawbar, enough to move a loaded freight train up the Wasatch grades at a steady pace. The design did not just meet the challenge, it set a new standard for what was possible. Where others saw a recipe for disaster, the blueprint revealed a careful balance of weight, force, and flexibility. The skeptics had their doubts, but the math was sound. All that remained was to put steel to rail and see if the numbers held up in the real world. On a cold April morning in 1941, Union Pacific's new machine, now officially numbered 4,000, stood ready at the Ogden Yards. Skeptics from across the industry gathered to watch, pencils hovering over notepads, waiting for the moment when theory would meet steel. The test was simple, but brutal. 3,600 tons of freight, unassisted, up the Wasatch grade. No helpers waited in the side. No backup plan. Just big boy. A full head of steam. And the mountain. The engineer eased the throttle open. 16 massive driving wheels dug into the rails, and the train began to move. There was no lurch, no groan of metal under strain, just steady rising power. The dynamometer car, hooked directly behind the tender, recorded every pound of pull, every surge of horsepower. As the train climbed the 1.14% grade, the numbers told a story the doubters could not ignore. 6,290 horsepower at the drawbar, a steady climb at nearly 20 miles per hour, and not a hint of wheel slip. Crews along the line watched in disbelief as the mile-long freight snaked through the curves, with no rails buckled, no ties splintered, no ballast churned loose beneath the weight. At the summit, the dynamometer report confirmed what no one had dared to claim before. Big Boy had conquered the Wasatch, hauling a 3,600-ton train unassisted at speeds that left the old double-headers far behind. The engine's articulation let it glide through the bends, while its equalized suspension spread the load so evenly that track inspectors found no evidence of damage, just shining rails where the giant had passed. For the first time, a single locomotive had proven it could do the impossible and do it with margin to spare. The skeptics had their answer, written in coal smoke and cold numbers. Big Boy was not just a theory anymore, it was a fact. Rolling west with the freight the, the freight the nation needed most. Union Pacific did not stop at a single prototype. After Big Boy number 4000 proved its worth, the railroad placed an order for 24 more, bringing the total fleet to 25 by 1944. These giants became the backbone of the Wyoming and Utah main lines, assigned to the toughest stretches between Ogden, Green River, and later Cheyenne. Each locomotive stood over 132 feet long and tipped the scales at more than 1.2 million pounds. But the real story was in their daily work. For nearly two decades, big boys pulled the heaviest wartime and post-war freight trains over the mountains, sometimes logging over 1 million miles apiece. Crews who ran the Wasatch and Sherman Hill divisions came to rely on Big Boy's strength and sure-footed handling. Firemen kept the massive boilers fed with coal, while engineers managed the throttle and watched the mountain grades roll by. 
on busy days, a big boy might make two round trips between Ogden and Green River, each time hauling thousands of tons of freight that once would have demanded a string of helpers. Yardmasters and dispatchers saw the difference in their schedules, fewer delays, quicker turnarounds, and a smoother flow of trains across the bottleneck. But the economics of railroading changed quickly after the war. By the late 1950s, diesel-electric locomotives offered lower fuel costs, simpler maintenance, and smaller crews. One by one, the big boys were retired from active service. The last regular run came in July, 1959. Even as they were set aside, their reputation among railroaders was secure. These locomotives had delivered on every promise, outlasting the skeptics and reshaping mountain railroading for a generation. Eight big boys escaped the scrapper's torch, scattered across the country as silent reminders of an era when horsepower ruled the rails. For decades, they stood behind fences and in city parks, their wheels frozen and boilers cold. Then, in 2013, Union Pacific made a decision that stunned the railroad world. Big Boy No. 4014 would return to life. The locomotive, retired since 1961 and on display in California, was hauled to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where a team of engineers and volunteers began the painstaking work of restoration. Inside the Cheyenne steam shop, old blueprints were pulled from files and laid beside modern schematics. Every bolt, bearing, and boiler tube had to be inspected or replaced. The crew faced a mountain of challenges. Decades of rust, worn out parts, and the need to meet today's strict safety standards made the job even harder. Over six years, they rebuilt the giant from the wheels up. In a restoration that blended original craftsmanship with new technology, by May 2019, steam filled the shop again. Number 4014 rolled out under its own power, the world's only operational big boy. When number 4014 thundered down the main line, crowds lined the tracks from Cheyenne to Ogden, just as they had in 1941. The million-pound locomotive glided over the same rails its builders once feared it would destroy, proving that the bold ideas of the 1940s still hold true. Every excursion is a living answer to the doubters, a moving monument to engineering vision, restored by hands that believe some machines are too important to let fade away. Innovation doesn't just rewrite rules. It exposes the limits of our imagination. Today, a million-pound steam locomotive still rolls across tracks once deemed too fragile, a living contradiction to decades of expert doubt. As we debate the boundaries of technology and infrastructure, Big Boy stands as proof. What we call impossible often just hasn't been tried. What boundary are we questioning next? Share your thoughts below.